This video was sponsored by Let's Get Rusty. Today we're going to cover some low-level concepts that you probably never have to think about, unless you're working at the systems level. One of the most frequent video suggestions I receive is to explain why some projects seem to involve multiple programming languages in their development. Explaining this can be either extremely easy or extremely difficult, depending on the type of project. Take a full-stack framework like Django, for example. Python is used to handle the backend, which runs on the server, and HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to build the user interface displayed on the client side. This is a multi-language project, but in this case, it's easy to understand how everything works in production because we're essentially developing two separate processes that communicate remotely at runtime using some form of inter-process communication. But there are other types of projects where components written in different programming languages are meant to run together as a single process. So how are these kinds of projects even possible? Hi friends, my name is George, and this is Core Dumped. If you follow this channel, I'm pretty sure you love low-level systems. And that's exactly why I'm excited to say that this video is sponsored by Let's Get Rusty. Let's be honest, Rust is no longer the language of the future. It's the language of the present. Don't take my word for it. Just look at the industry. Big companies are betting big on Rust for building critical systems. Google, Microsoft, even the Linux kernel itself are now integrating Rust into their core systems. That's not hype. That's happening. And if you're thinking about leveling up your Rust skills, whether for personal growth or to land a job working on real systems, Let's Get Rusty is the go-to place for Rust training. Created by a fellow YouTuber and one of the most beloved names in the Rust online community, Let's Get Rusty has helped thousands of developers, myself included by the way, master the language and break into systems programming. They're running a new cohort very soon, and since spots are limited, now's a great time to check it out. Visit letsgetrusty.com slash startwithgeorge or just click the link in the pinned comment below. Big thanks to Let's Get Rusty for supporting the channel. And now, let's get into today's video. For simplicity, let's start by considering only programming languages that compile down to machine code. Generally, each programming language has its own dedicated compiler, so we can't just take, say, a Rust file and compile it using the Go compiler. That's where things start to get interesting, and a bit confusing, if most programming languages have separate compilers, runtimes, and memory models, how can they possibly live inside the same binary? What often confuses people is the common oversimplification that compilers are just tools that turn source code directly into executable files. Now don't get me wrong, compilers do produce executable files, but that's only the final result of a much more complex multi-step process that we usually don't see. To illustrate this, let's look at a simple C program. If you are not a C developer, don't worry. This program simply prints a message, but the message it prints changes depending on the operating system you're running it on. On most GNU Linux systems, the go-to compiler for C is GCC. It used to stand for GNU C compiler, but that's no longer true. And in a moment, you'll understand why. To compile and run our C program, we usually just call GCC and pass it the file or files we want to compile. Then, an executable is generated. From our perspective, it's just two simple steps, one to compile the program and another one to run it. But under the hood, the compiler is doing a whole lot more. Internally, GCC goes through four main phases to turn a C file into a working executable. Now, GCC deserves its own deep dive, but I'll break it down quickly here. The first step is pre-processing. This prepares the source code by doing things like removing comments, expanding macros, resolving conditional compilation, and crucially, resolving includes. When you use include, the C preprocessor replaces that line with the contents of the header file and all the headers it includes, effectively inserting that code into our file before compilation begins. So the output is still C code, but preprocessed for the next step. Next comes compilation, but not directly into machine code. Instead, the pre-processed code is translated into assembly language, which is the instructions that the computer will execute, but still in a human-readable language. So here's our first myth busted. A compiler doesn't always convert source code into machine code. In fact, many compilers convert source code into an intermediate representation, like assembly, or even into another programming language. 
The third step involves the assembler, which is technically another compiler, but it takes the human readable assembly code from the previous phase and translates it into machine code, the ones and zeros your CPU understands. The result is called an object file. But here's the catch. This object file isn't runnable yet. GCC still needs to resolve the position within the binary where functions will be placed. In our simple example, we're just printing text to the console. But remember, the actual implementation of the printf function lives in the C standard library. So that library also needs to go through the same compilation steps we just described. This brings us to the final step, linking. At this stage, we may have multiple object files, some from our code, others from external libraries we included during development. The linker's job is to combine all these object files into a single self-contained executable. There are two ways to do this. The easiest is to take the machine code of each required function from the library and copy it into the final executable. This is called static linking. All the library functions our program needs are embedded directly into the output file. Everything is self-contained and hence ready to run whenever we want. But another option is dynamic linking. Think about how many programs on your system use the print function from the standard library. If every one of those programs statically included its own copy of that function, you'd end up with thousands of identical copies stored across your disk. With dynamic linking, libraries are pre-compiled into a special type of file called a dynamic shared library. On Unix-like systems, these libraries have the .so file extension, while on Windows, they are identified by the .dll extension. These dynamic shared libraries are similar to executable files in that they contain executable code for the functions provided by the library. The key difference is that they don't contain an entry point to start execution, which makes sense, as libraries typically don't have a main function, which is used to start a program. When our program is compiled with dynamic linking, the linker won't copy the functions from the library directly into the executable. Instead, it will simply insert a reference to the library that contains the machine instructions for that function. At runtime, if the program needs a function from that dynamic library, the operating system will load the required function into the program's address space, so the program can use it as if it were part of the executable. While this may sound a bit strange at first, it's actually incredibly efficient. Instead of storing multiple copies of the same function across different programs, the system only stores the library once. Each program that needs it simply references the shared library and loads it only when necessary, on demand at runtime. This saves both disk space and memory, a huge advantage, especially on systems with lots of programs that depend on common libraries. It's also more flexible, since you can update or patch a library without having to recompile every program that uses it. Linking both static and dynamic, is a deep topic that honestly deserves its own video. If you're interested in learning more, let me know in the comments, and I'll dedicate a full episode to explaining how linking works, including the ins and outs of dynamic libraries. Now back to the compilation steps. You might be wondering, what's the point of all this modularization? Why break the process into so many phases if the compiler could just go directly from source to executable? Well, the reason we don't normally see all these intermediate steps is because compilers like GCC are configured by default to hide them. They just show you the final result, the executable. But with the right flags, we can expose all those phases. For example, using GCC, if you compile a program and add the save temps flag, you'll get not just the final executable, but also all the intermediate files. We can even stop the process at a specific stage. For example, the S flag makes the process stop after generating assembly. This is incredibly useful in educational settings, where you might want to see how high-level C code translates to assembly or machine code. In professional environments, this is also used to inspect performance-critical code. You can look at the generated assembly to verify whether the compiler is producing efficient instructions. Even more interesting, we can start from any phase in the pipeline, we can pass GCC the assembly file and simply tell it to assemble and link it. This is huge, because it means we can write part of our code in assembly, pass it to the compiler at different stages, and then the linker will take care of mixing them together into an executable file. 
This already starts to answer our original question. Let's walk through an example. Suppose we need to write a program that calculates how many prime numbers exist between zero and a given number, and we want it to be as fast as possible. We could write the whole thing in C, but let's say we don't trust the compiler optimizations, so we decide to write the heavy calculation function directly in assembly and just call it from C. Then we pass both files to GCC, which will compile and assemble the C code, assemble the assembly code, and link both object files into a single executable file. And voila, we've just compiled a multi-language project. This technique is used by real-world systems like the Linux kernel, FFmpeg, OpenSSL, and many embedded projects. They often contain C for most of the logic, but fall back to assembly when performance really matters. Now, here's a fact that a lot of you might have already concluded, but I'm still going to mention anyways. What we casually call the C compiler, like GCC, isn't just one compiler. It's actually a tool chain, a pipeline of tools that are executed in sequence. Each stage consumes the output of the previous one, and each of these tools is pluggable. We can replace parts of the tool chain or feed in our own files at various points. This is why GCC doesn't just support C. It also supports C++, Objective-C, Fortran, Ada, D, and even Go, depending on how it's configured. Originally, GCC stood for GNU C compiler, but over time it evolved into a compiler suite that supports many programming languages beyond C. Because of this expansion, the name GNU C compiler became misleading. So, the acronym GCC was redefined to mean GNU Compiler Collection. I think this is really important to understand. Every time someone casually calls it the GNU C compiler, it can unintentionally reinforce the idea that this whole system is a single black box that transforms C code into a runnable file. But the truth is, it hasn't been just that for many years now. Okay, but assembly isn't for everyone. And to be fair, since assembly is already part of the compilation pipeline, using it feels a bit like cheating. So what about mixing high-level languages instead? For example, instead of writing a function in assembly, what if we implement part of our project in Fortran? Well, this is totally possible, and actually more common than it might seem. In this case, however, we usually need multiple steps. One to compile and assemble the Fortran file, another one to compile and assemble the C file, and a third to assemble both object files into a single executable. Unlike assembly, which is already embedded in the C compilation pipeline, Fortran has its own pipeline, its own compiler, and sometimes even its own runtime dependencies. And by now, it should be super clear that the answer to our original question, how can different languages live inside a single executable, comes down to the linker. You see, the different languages involved don't even need to come from the same compiler suite as GCC. Take Rust, for example. It has a completely different tool chain from C, different compiler, different build system, and a different philosophy altogether. I could spend hours talking about the insane engineering behind its compiler. But what we care is that when it comes time to produce the final binary, guess what? Rust, too, relies on a linker. So if we want to call a Rust function from C, here's how we do it. We implement the function in Rust. We compile the Rust code into a static or dynamic library. We declare and use the function in the C code. Then, we compile the C code and link it with the Rust compiled library. And of course, it works the other way too. We can call C functions from Rust. It all depends on what we're trying to achieve. In fact, it's more common to call C code from Rust than the other way around. C is older, and many mature libraries and system APIs are written in C. Rust developers often need to hook into that existing ecosystem, especially in areas like graphics, cryptography, or operating system APIs. There are several reasons why you might want to mix multiple programming languages in a single project, but another one that comes to mind is performance. In many projects, the entire system doesn't need to be blazing fast, just certain parts. So what a lot of developers do is write most of the project in a high-level language for convenience and development speed, and then implement only the performance-critical components in a lower-level language like C. Before we wrap up, there's one more really important point to understand. Let's say we have two high-level languages, language A and language B. Just because both of them have a final linking phase doesn't automatically mean they can be correctly linked together into one executable. 
Here's a very simple example. We've implemented a function in language B, and we're calling it from language A. Even if both compilers emit assembly for the same architecture, they might make different assumptions about how data is passed between functions. For example, the compiler for language A might pass the two function parameters in registers 0 and 1, but the compiler for language B might expect the parameters in registers 1 and 2. Both are producing valid machine code, but since their calling conventions differ, the result will be undefined behavior at runtime. Language A will place arguments in the wrong place, and language B will perform operations using incorrect data. And it doesn't stop there. In this example, there's another problem. After computing the result, the function writes it to register 1 and returns, but language A expects the result to be in register 0. So not only does language B compute the wrong result, but language A doesn't even see or use that result at all. The same example, but this time with two languages, X and Y. Here, both languages use register 0 and register 1 to pass and receive parameters. But let's say language X uses pass by reference for all function arguments. It puts the addresses of variables in the registers, which is not the same thing as putting the values of those variables directly in the registers. Meanwhile, language Y passes by value, so it expects the actual values in the registers. That's why here, it immediately add the content on those registers as soon as being called. At runtime, this mismatch causes language Y to interpret memory addresses as actual values, adding those addresses instead of the values stored at those addresses, leading to completely wrong behavior, or even a crash. So even though both compilers produce valid and executable assembly, the final linked binary is inconsistent unless both sides agree on how to talk to each other. These kinds of low-level rules are defined by what's known as the Application Binary Interface, or ABI. Just as an API defines functions at the application level, an ABI defines how different components of binary code interact with each other through the hardware. So, when we're mixing two different languages, it's not enough that they both produce object files. At least one of them, or specifically, the part of it that interacts with the other language, must conform to the other's ABI expectations. In our language X and language Y example, one way to make this work is by modifying language Y to dereference the values. That way, the function will first fetch the data from the memory addresses provided, loading the actual values into the registers before performing the addition. In this case, language Y is being made to conform to the ABI expectations of language X. But we could also take the opposite approach, make language X conform to the ABI expectations of language Y, by simply loading the argument values directly into the registers instead of their addresses. This way, the function in language Y can immediately add the values when it's called. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, these are low-level details that we usually don't have to think about unless working at the system level. The good news is, language designers know this. Modern languages provide tools, keywords, and compiler flags to make this process easier. In C, you might declare an external function using extern. In Rust, you'd use the extern keyword and the no mangle attribute. In Fortran, you can use the bind attribute. In Go, you can use a special block of comments placed directly above the line import C to include C header files. And it even lets you write inline C code directly in your Go source files. Every language has its own way of doing this, but at compile time, these declarations all serve the same purpose. They tell the compiler, hey, this function will interact with code written in another language. Please make sure the generated assembly follows the expected ABI. And let's wrap things up for now. In the next part, we will cover how to mix compiled languages with interpreted languages. So make sure to subscribe because you won't want to miss it. Don't forget to check Let's Get Rusty linked in the pinned comment below. And if you liked this video or learned something new, please hit the like button. It's free, and that would help me a lot. See you in the next one.